for our meditation tonight then, let us return to Luke's Gospel, chapter 8. We're going to concentrate upon these verses that we find in chapter, uh, verse 26 to 40. 26 to 40 of Luke, chapter 8, is what we are going to focus on this evening. And here we do have the well-known incident of the Gadarene demoniac and how he was marvelously healed by the Lord Jesus Christ, how he was delivered from demonic possession. The title I want to give <coughs> to the meditation tonight is Three Requests. Three Requests. And I hope that will become evident as we go through our meditation this evening. This, is, this incident is recorded in Matthew chapter 8 and in Mark chapter 5. And we will be drawing some material from these other gospel sources also. For instance, in Matthew chapter 8, we are told there were two demon possessed men who met the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people will say, therefore, there is a contradiction because Luke only mentions one. That, of course, is not the case. Both are true. Matthew records the two of them. Luke simply says, the, simply says one but he doesn't say there was only one. So there's no contradiction. There can be no contradiction in the Bible. The Bible ultimately is written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It has one author. And holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit to write what they did. And therefore there is no contradiction. And we have here a very heartwarming story. Two weeks ago, the last time we looked at Luke's Gospel, we noticed that the disciples were on a boat trip going from one side of the Sea of Galilee to the other side, or the Sea of Tiberias, or the Lake Gennesaret. It has three names. And as they were crossing the sea, a great storm arose and Jesus was in the back of the boat and several of these, indeed all of these disciples were, were, were in some sense alarmed. And as you know, some of these disciples were hardened fishermen, but they were fearful of their lives. And they go to the Lord Jesus and ultimately he calms the wind and the waves. And here we find them arriving at where they sought to go. We are told in verse 36, And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes. Having come through a storm, they arrived. And there's a wonderful lesson here for the people of God. With the Lord Jesus Christ leading and guiding with us, we will come through all kinds of storms and we will arrive at the appointed destination. It's for our encouragement because as we go through this life, as we make our pilgrimage, as we're on that narrow road that leads to life, we will find difficulties. We will find things that will stretch us. But we do not need to worry. With Jesus at the helm, he will take all his people to the desired haven or indeed the shore. And as he arrives here, he is met. He is met by this demon-possessed man. We are told he came out to the city. And this man didn't, he came out of the city, but he couldn't live in the city. Such was his problem. He was a man possessed with the devil. We are told he wore no clothes. He didn't uh, live in a house, but lived in the tombs. He was a, a wretched individual, 
a desperate individual, someone who was his own greatest enemy, and he was a, a thorough pest as far as the community was concerned. They couldn't handle him. They put chains and fetters upon him, seeking to, in some sense, contain him. But there were occasions when he would break all of these things. Nothing could contain him. And he was totally a mess. And as Mark will tell us, he not only did these things that I've mentioned, but he even harmed himself. He was into self-harm. Here we have a, a pathetic description of a man, really, who's at his wit's end having been possessed by the evil one. <clears throat> well, in this incident here, the Lord Jesus Christ reveals his power over the devils. Previously, he had revealed his power over the storm, over the elements, but now he reveals his power over the spiritual world a world that, quite frankly, we know very little about. Yet the Lord Jesus Christ displays his awesome power. Nevertheless, how he deals, how he deals with the three requests that we find in this incident may well surprise us. And looking for the Lord's blessing and seeking that blessing, I want to focus upon these three requests that we find in this incident here. First of all then, we have the devil's request. We might find it concentrated in verse 31, where we're told, and they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And we're told in verse 33, and there was there an herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. And he suffered them. And all throughout this incident, friends, we are to bear in mind that the Lord Jesus was the one who was in control. And here were devils. And they petitioned the Son of God. And the Son of God heard their petition. And the Son of God answered their petition. Give them exactly what they wanted. And this would tell us that there was someone greater than the devil here. The devil was able to wreck and ruin the life of this individual here. And by the life of this individual to cause problems even for the society round about him because the society round about him could not handle him. But here was Jesus and he was in complete and utter control. And this is for the comfort of the Christian. This is to increase our faith. We have one who is greater than our greatest enemy. And we do have an enemy. We have an enemy who is powerful. We have an enemy who is out to wreck everything that the Lord our God wants to do. And who has been in constant rebellion against the Lord our God since that time that he fell. And he will never give up. The devil knows that he cannot overcome he cannot in any sense thwart God. Yet, because it is in his nature, he must act according to his nature. And his nature is to completely and utterly rebel against God. And yet we have here in the Lord Jesus, God in the flesh, someone who is greater and who is mightier than our chief enemy. And this, friends, is for the comfort of the Christian. It's to remind us that we are to look unto the Lord Jesus. We're not to concentrate upon the evil one, but to concentrate on that one who is greater than the evil one. And that one who was tempted by the evil one. We know that 
just before he began his public ministry, when he was baptized. We looked at it earlier on, when he was baptized. And after God had publicly declared that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, he was tempted of the devil and he went in, into the wilderness. And for 40 days and 40 nights he was tempted of the evil one. But blessed be God, hallelujah, we would say, he did not succumb, he did not fall. And that's the Savior that you and I are ours to have dealings with. <clears throat> to call upon Him. And to trust Him. And we know ultimately this man was restored. He was made whole again. He was delivered from his demoniac possession. But it's interesting that Jesus agreed to the request. And some people would criticize what Jesus did here. Because what happened? Well, they asked that they might go and take possession of the pigs. Jesus agreed. And as you know what happened, they went, they left the man, and they went in to the pigs. And Mark will tell us there were around 2,000 of them, quite a sizable herd or flock or whatever you would call a, a group of pigs. And as soon as they went in to the pigs, the pigs ran over the edge of the cliff into the water and they were drowned. And people will, will criticize the Lord Jesus Christ for that. Here was the livelihood of many people taken away from them. Why did Jesus do it? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ granted their request, but he did not tell them to go and run with the pigs into the water and be drowned. That was something they did themselves. We cannot criticize the Lord Jesus for that. But people do, simply because he agreed to the request and so many innocent animals were destroyed in a moment. 2,000. And no doubt the livelihoods of many people were put in jeopardy because of what the devils did. But it's important to realize it was the devils that did it, not the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's another lesson for us to learn here, friends. What we're dealing with here is something that I firmly believe we know very little about. We're talking here about being possessed by demons. Now the Bible does most certainly teach that the natural man is under the thraldom of the evil one. There's no doubt about that. And even that itself might alarm many people today, but that is the truth. That is what the Bible says about the natural man. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, as Paul was speaking to the Ephesians who had received the gospel and he was reminding them of their former state as unbelievers. He says in chapter 2, verse 2, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. He is talking about the fact that once upon a time, before they were converted, they were no different from anybody else. And they were under the power and the influence of of the evil one, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The children of disobedience are those who are unbelievers. And every single one of us was an unbeliever at some time, and maybe we are still unbelievers. And then we need to realize that according to the word of God, we are under the thraldom and the influence of the devil. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says much the same in different words. Paul is talking about unbelievers in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Satan is active. 
Satan is active in the natural man. He blinds them to the truth of the gospel. He will continually tell the unbeliever that the things that we find in the word of God and the things that the preacher preaches is not true and they are blinded. That is the ordinary action of the devil in the hearts and in the lives of every natural man. But what we have here is something far more serious and far more dangerous. It may well be true to say that the devil in some sense has, the, has dominion over the soul of man, over the soul of the natural man, but here we find the devil not having dominion over the soul, but actually possessing the body. And that is something completely and utterly different. We are not to imagine that today, ordinarily, the natural man is in the same situation as, as this man. This man was truly in a desperate and dire situation. And this would indicate to us that the time that Christ came was a particularly wicked time in the history of mankind. Because what we find here, we find on other occasions in the Bible, we hear more about people being uh, possessed by devils. Now, we're not saying it doesn't happen today. We're not saying that for one moment. But we do not know so much about it. Or we do not hear so much about it. And therefore, this would indicate that when this happened in New Testament times, the times were particularly evil. The devil was in some sense <coughs> reigning in a way that he is not reigning today. And he's not reigning in the same way today because the gospel has been set forth. And in some sense, and we stress in some sense, the devil doesn't have the same liberty and freedom that he once had. He is, in some sense, bound and chained. Not completely. But he does not have the influence that he once did because of the gospel. <clears throat> but he gives them their request. And what happens? They go from possessing an individual, ruining his life, to ruining the lives of 2,000 pigs. And this is a picture of what the evil one does and continues to do. He brings havoc, he brings destruction, he brings death, he brings misery. But we are blessed. The Lord Jesus Christ is there and this poor demon-possessed man was delivered and his life was transformed. And this would again remind us, friends, that we have a glorious friend, a glorious saviour, a one that we are urged to seek and to follow and to trust and to believe in, knowing that he will save to the uttermost. Well, he granted the request of the devils. What else can we say? Well, we want to notice, <coughs> before we pass on to point number two, we want to notice <coughs> his question, the devil's question. He says in verse 28, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God Most High? Here's a question the devil presents to the Lord Jesus. Now, if you're remembering, and very often we don't remember that much, but two weeks ago, the disciples asked this question. Is it not true 
in verse 25, which we did not read this week, but verse 25 of this chapter, the disciples asked the question when the Lord had calmed the storm. What manner of man is this? For he commanded even the winds and water, and they obey him. And here we find the devils answering that very question. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? There's the answer the disciples were looking for. This was the man who was able to calm the winds and the storms. He is Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. He is God in the flesh. And the devils were able to give that testimony, to give that confession. They knew about the Lord Jesus. And notice also what they say following the question, And I beseech thee, torment me not. In Matthew's account, that last phrase is somewhat, somewhat enlarged. In Matthew chapter, 20, uh, chapter 8, verse 29, And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Here we have the devils recognizing that this is the Son of God, and also recognizing they've got a day coming when they'll meet him, and when he will judge them, and he will send them to their ultimate destiny. That's what's going to happen to them. And they knew all this. So in many respects, friends, what I'm trying to draw out of this for us is that the devils have, in some sense, an orthodox testimony. They have an orthodox confession. They recognize Jesus as being the Son of God. And they recognize there's a day of judgment coming. And they recognize that their day is coming when they shall be utterly condemned. They recognize all these things and probably much more. But even in this short period when they were before the Lord Jesus, they recognized he was God in the flesh. And they recognized that one day they will be sent to the bottomless pit. There may well be people here who would also have that same confession, who will recognize the deity of the Lord Jesus, and they will recognize there's a day of reckoning coming. Don't think for one moment that just to be orthodox is enough to save. Something more is required. What is it? You must put your faith in him. You must exercise faith in the Lord Jesus. You must turn from your sins and you must confess him. You must believe upon him and rest your salvation completely and utterly and entirely upon the Lord Jesus Christ. But also, the devils here have an accurate confession that many people who should know better don't have. Many people don't acknowledge that he is the Son of God, that he is God in the flesh. They don't. And they don't recognize that there is a terrible day coming. A terrible day when the Lord Jesus shall be in all his glory and they will stand before him. That will happen, friends. And we need to be prepared for it that we might be acquitted on that awesome and glorious day. We might ask ourselves then, why was their request granted? Why did the devil, why did Jesus listen to the devils and grant their request? It's a difficult one to answer, and I'm not sure that I can answer, but I would say this to you. 
that he answered them because there's no hope for them. There's no gospel for the demons. There's no gospel for the devils. They have no hope. None whatsoever. This should make us rejoice because the Lord Jesus became a man in order to save men. It's mankind that he went out to save and not the angels. The fallen angels have no hope. In Jude we're told in verse 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment of that great day. Fallen angels are kept for judgment. There's no redemption. There's no mercy. We know that fallen angels have come and they're active in the world. We know that these things because they have been revealed unto us. But we know so very little of the spiritual world. But we know for definite that there is no mercy for angels. Who have fallen. And this should cause us to rejoice that there is mercy for the sons of men. Secondly, then, we might look at the second request we find here, and it's the request of the people. And we find it in verse 37. Then the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about besought him to depart from them. For they were taken with great fear. And he went up into the ship and returned back again. This is remarkable. What happened here? Well, the man was delivered. And the people came and they saw this man sitting with Jesus. They saw him in his right mind. They saw him clothed. They saw him normal. They saw him happy. They saw him completely restored. Here was a man who was useless who was a, an enemy to himself and to all of society, and by the work of the Lord Jesus having delivered him, he was now a useful citizen in his right mind. And they came and they saw this, and they were afraid with great fear. And we can understand why there was great fear upon them, because truly a wonderful miracle had occurred. But nevertheless, they were so afraid and so against what happened that they wanted the Lord Jesus to leave them. To leave their vicinity. Well, I would ask this question of them. Were there not other people in the vicinity, in the neighborhood, who could benefit from the Lord Jesus? Jesus had performed a glorious miracle here. He had displayed his awesome power that was there, given to him by the Holy Spirit. Could he not have healed the sick? Could he not have opened the eyes of the blind? Could he not have loosed the tongue of those who couldn't speak? Or open the ears of the deaf? Could he not have done many other things to the people there? No doubt there was many sick and many problems. And if they brought them to the Lord Jesus, he would have healed them. But instead, they wanted Jesus to leave them. To leave their coasts. <coughs> Why? Well, friends, the reason is quite clear. They were people that were taken up with worldly things. Two thousand of their pigs were destroyed. Livelihoods were in jeopardy. And they didn't want Jesus. They didn't want what he would bring. Their minds were set upon earthly things. They didn't value the life of this poor individual. This poor individual had a terrible existence, living in the tombs, naked, hurting himself, being a danger to all around. They cared nothing for him 
They simply cared for pounds and pence and for their own convenience. It makes us think about human nature. Because the spirit that has been displayed here among the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes is prevalent in our own society. We have people who have causes for this and for that. They're concerned about animal welfare. They're concerned about birds of prey. They're concerned even about seagulls. If you harm or damage or kill a seagull, you're liable to be prosecuted, maybe even be put in prison. People today are taken up with all kinds of causes, but they think nothing of fellow human beings. The obvious one to think about is abortion. We know it's a terrible crime. No one says a word. Thousands are aborted. You shoot a bird and you're an outcast. You abort a baby and no one blinks an eye. This can be in the church also. We can get taken up with secondary things and little things, things that are not really important. What about the souls of the lost, the perishing? Do we really value <coughs> the souls of the never dying people that are round about us? Do we care for them? Do we expend any energy seeking to reach out? Are we concerned? These people there were simply concerned about pounds and pence, worldly things. And they didn't appreciate and value that someone who was a pathetic creature had his life restored to him. This was the request that the people said to the Lord Jesus. And as I move on to point three, we might say that the request was granted to a certain extent. We are told that Christ did leave. He did depart. And verse 40 will tell us, and it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, that is returned to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. So he left the scene of the miracle, and the people told him to go, and he went. And he crossed over to the other side where he had originally come from, and the people there were waiting for him and welcomed him. And what you will find, friends, is that when people reject the Lord Jesus Christ, however long it might take, but when they reject him and his gospel, he will go somewhere else, and he will be received, and he will be welcomed. That's what happened here. But he did not totally agree to the request. Because as we look at the third request, we will find that Jesus did not completely and utterly abandon them. Because thirdly, we have the man's request. And when we say the man's request, we're looking here at the man who had been healed. And the man who had been healed in verse 38 says, Now the man out of whom the devils had departed besought him that he might be with Jesus. But Jesus sent him away saying, Return to thine own house and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. Hold on to this thought, friends. Hold on to this. 
The people say, Jesus, go. We don't want you. Jesus goes, but what does, he, what does he do? He leaves a missionary in the place so that they are without excuse, so that they could see that this was the man who was possessed of the devils. Now he's in his right mind and he has opened his mouth and he's going around and telling them all what Jesus Christ has done for him. They thought they would get rid of Jesus. But Jesus plants his missionary. Do we not see here something of the love and the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus? How he did not totally abandon them, but he left someone there who every day he went out would be able, even by his presence, he didn't even need to speak, but by his presence, it would be clear that Jesus had done this. And this man's request then was not granted. Here was someone who wanted to show his love and his devotion to the Savior. And who could blame him? He had lived a desperate life and now he, he had a normal life. And how could he attribute this change? It was only to the Lord Jesus. And he wanted to show his love. He wanted to show his devotion. He wanted to show his affection to the Lord Jesus by following him. He wanted to be a follower of Jesus. He owed his very life, his very existence to Christ. And the least he could do as far as he was concerned was to be a follower. To be a publicly associated with Christ. What a, a notable desire we might say. An understandable desire. He wanted to be with Christ. Full time. Devote himself to the service of Christ. It wasn't granted because the Lord had a, another mission for him. Return to thine own house. Now, to return to thine own house, it would obviously mean first and foremost going back to whatever family he had. We're not told. We might assume he had a wife. Maybe children. Maybe parents still alive. Brothers, sisters, the hardest place to witness in your own sitting room, beside your own fireplace, the hardest place. These people know you intimately. They know your faults. They know your failings. And very often they're not sympathetic to your new way of life. Return to thine own house. There, by your actions, not just your words, but by your actions, by the change in your life, you are to show that you belong to the Lord Jesus. And no doubt he would go out into the community <clears throat> and others would know him. Others would have grown up with them and they would have seen this transformation. And even if he didn't utter a word, it would be obvious that there was a new power and a new influence in his life. And he would, he would have opportunities. People would ask him, oh, I remember you. I remember you when you were in the graves. I remember you when you were scraping yourself. What happened to you? I met the Lord Jesus. Who is this Lord Jesus? He's the one who saved me. And what he's done for me, he can do for you. And we are told, and he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. Friends, <coughs> Let us take a leaf out of this man's book. We might think it's a wonderful thing to be in the gospel ministry, to be a preacher, 
and to stand before people and to seek to bring God's word and open up it and explain it and all these kind of things associated with the public ministry. Or we might think it's a wonderful thing to go to a far country and to bring the gospel to a place where the gospel is not known. Well, it's a far more difficult thing to go home to your family and to tell them of the Lord Jesus. Far more difficult. I think I'm recording this accurately. A young man came to forward to Charles Haddon Spurgeon and said that he's been called to the mission field. And Spurgeon, in his practical divinity and his practical wisdom, basically said to him, what have you done in your locality? What have you done in your house for the Lord? Nothing. Don't think for one moment then that you'll be a missionary. Don't think for one moment. If you don't make an impact in your home, you'll never make an impact anywhere. And this man's request was denied. A good request. But by Jesus' infinite wisdom, it wasn't going to be granted. And that would surprise us. The devils, their request was fully met. The people who rejected the Lord Jesus, to a certain extent it was met, but not totally. But the man's request was denied completely. The Christian's request was denied completely because Jesus had something more positive and more beneficial for that man to do than to follow the Lord Jesus. Three requests answered in ways that would surprise us. Amen. And may the Lord bless his word to us.